Roy, Roy A. Periana completed his Ph.D. in chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley, 1985. As an industrial chemist, he has worked at Dow Chemical Company, 1979 to 1981, Monsanto Company, 1985-1988, as a group leader at Catalytica, sorry, mm -hmm. 1988, and was a co-founder and vice president of research at Catalytica Advanced Technologies, 1994. He then joined the chemistry department at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles, California, in 2000. During his time at USC, he was a member of the LOCAR Hydrocarbon Institute and director for the USC Caltech Chevron Consortium on Catalysis. Since 2001, Professor Periana has been a visiting associate in the chemistry department at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He was a co-founder and served on the board of directors for Quetiomics. These are good words. I like this. Study this. 2007, he was appointed professor and director of the Scripps Energy and Materials Center at the Scripps Research Institute. During his career, he authored many articles and chapters that have been published in notable journals, such as Science, and covered in Chemical and Engineering News, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times. He has been an invited speaker at numerous national and international conferences. The central focus of his research is establishing the foundational science needed to move to the next generation of cleaner, less expensive technologies in the energy and chemical sectors. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Good morning, Jay. Thank you for the invitation. And if I knew you were going to read the entire thing, I would have um, made it a lot shorter. That's on my website. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I, I don't know if any of you know anything about the Scripps Research Institute. Does anyone know about Scripps? Show of hands. Wow, so we clearly aren't doing a very good job um, of publicizing who we are. Um, I think Florida gave us on the order of 300 million to move here. So you probably should know a bit about that since it's your tax dollars. Uh, so we were located, well, we still are uh, in La Jolla. And um, I guess what I was told, the president got a call from uh, Governor Bush and said, well, uh, would you like to move part of your facilities here to start a high-tech uh, center in biotech? Um, and here's the result. Uh, we, we have two campuses, one in, in California, one here. We are a graduate program, research institute, and we uh, televise classes, so we have one program. Um, we're really, we're professors, um, but most of us are entrepreneurs. Um, we, we are trying to solve problems and in the course of doing that, teaching. So I, I actually think the best way to teach is to solve a very important problem. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about, I mean, most of you may know us as uh, biomedical research. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do there. Okay, so just a, a bit uh, of, of our PR. Um, uh, this is Scripps, Florida. And many people think of research organizations as a big money pit. Uh, it really isn't. Um, it's, it's, I'll, I'll show you the next slide. This is kind of where, this is La Jolla and uh, San Diego, and, and this is what's happened from these research institutes, huge com numbers of companies, and this is mostly in life sciences. I came here with the idea of being a part of that, to, to, to generate our energy course with, uh, coast with lots of high-tech uh, organizations in the energy area. What we've done is brought in a lot of money. That money actually filters right into the community, most of it. A lot of it is in buying chemicals and materials. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, we're, we're looking, in fact, we are now, myself, looking to raise money to spin out a company here. Uh, but you can see we, we generate a lot of uh, patents, license, graduate students, uh, lots of staff here, uh, spin out companies. So as a research organization, we are actually generating considerable value now. The upside, of course, is that as we create companies, uh, hopefully a lot of those companies will stay here. And, and hopefully we can become a nucleus for building um, high-tech organizations here. My focus is to do that in the energy sector. I'm, I, I won't build that myself, obviously, but, but perhaps uh, we'll create a nucleus for starting to do that. Okay, so you may or may not have heard about Scripps and the vision of Scripps. It's pretty simple. It's, it's, it's kind of a very lofty goal. Uh, the key word I want you to see here is chemistry. We're really 
looking at, at using chemistry and, and how it could benefit uh, mankind or womankind also. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Scripps Energy and Materials Center that I'm the director of. Where I'm a professor of chemistry. One of my interests is, is to build a center that will attract other professors to work on some of the toughest problems, and I believe one of the most valuable uh, problems that mankind is facing with. I won't get into all the PR around sustainability, but uh, to achieve that, uh, people have got to make profits, you've got to have jobs, you have to have a great economy. Obviously, the environment needs to be clean, and that's, I'm a hippie from the hippie time. Uh, we want to have a peace, as, and a, a, if everything's working well, I, I think uh, contribute to world peace. That's the fun part of them. So what's the strategy here? Well, what we do at, at Scripps, and as a research organization, and as a, a, a teaching organization, um, and most of us, I've come from the Silicon Valley, what we are looking for is, is not today's technology. If you heard, there's a lot of fantastic people working on today's technology. What we're organization looking to do is to create disruptive technologies, right? Um, we want to look into the next five years, perhaps 10 years, and potentially we may bypass a lot of what you're hearing about. But of course, we need to do something in the next 10 years so the existing technologies will, will continue to be used. But what we're looking to do, so you'll, you've seen uh, lots of technologies that are being developed, right? So this is the goal, ultimately. Uh, you're hearing about electrical cars, algae. Um, and what we've recognized over the years is that science and technology has S-curve characteristics, that is, uh, and I actually had one company had me spend uh, money, money spent in research versus progress. And when you do that, you'll see that you're spending money, you're taking technology, and you can project it uh, uh, where it's going to get to. What you don't know is that at some point, an invention is going to come along. And that's not, you, can't, you can't predict when that's going to happen, and you can't multiply the rate of burn as to when it's going to happen. When it happens, it's very disruptive takes you off into a totally new sphere that you could never have achieved. The problem is you don't know when that uh, the invention will peter out in terms of taking you towards your goal. And it does happen. I've had several of these experiences in my life. The problem with this is twofold. When you're here, you project there, and it's wrong. When you're here, you project you're going to get to your goal there, and you're wrong. How do you know when you're going to make these disruptions? And, and you, you don't, but that's where you have to get into real fundamental study of, of what you're doing. And if you do it well enough, you know when you've got to jump off that curve. Um, so what we are looking for is disruptive technologies. Right? What's the, and, and we're not afraid to ask questions like, well, what's the ultimate going to look like? And, and, and then we back up and say, well, do we have the science for that? And we're, we're willing to ask that question because of who we are, the research organization we teach. Our goal is to stay in the top 10 research organizations. And to do that, we've got to have the next generation of science out there. So, so we, we ask, well, how do we enable uh, an electrical society? Um, how do we get away from oil completely? Right? How do we clean up the environment? And what we do is back up all the way to the fundamental pieces of science that's missing and put that science in place. Now, business people hate us because that's not going to happen in the next year or two years, right? So it's a very difficult sell, but that's what we do as a research organization. We've been doing that for cancer. We're doing that for aging. Uh, those are applications of chemistry. Why can't we do it there? I'd submit that that's going to have as much impact on our health and well-being. So, so this is what we are doing, is looking at disruptive uh, science. OK, so what's the approach? Well, we sat back and asked, well, how do we get to that sustainable planet? And, and make sure we've got to generate profits in the, in the process of doing that, right? So how do we move to a, a world where everything is run on electricity? Um, and you'll see, I think, that's where we need to go. How do we get away from, from not using oil at all? And those are two examples. I'll pick up one. How do we pollute less? Right? 
how do we have our lifestyle drive our, our V8, like have a sports car, and not feel bad about what it's doing on the back end? Right? Um, those are the ideals, right? That keep people's lifestyle and yet clean up the planet. And, and when you, when there's a strict constraints, when you do that, you need new science, and that science doesn't exist. And what I'm showing you here are really five molecules that are at the source of all of our problems. The dilemma is that the world stopped working on these molecules about 20 years ago or more. Um, because if you talk to people, these are considered some of the holy grails in chemistry. Unfortunately, that word is a terrible word, holy grail, right? It means something that can't be achieved. And I think what that meant then is that it was going to take too long and too much money. And the world had established technology. So for example, we make petroleum, right? We make fertilizer. Why do we need to make it any cheaper, was the question. Well, it turns out, take food, fertilizer, ammonia, right? That uses 2% of the world's energy. Well, we have lots of energy, why not, right? It turns out that that ammonia comes from, well, actually nitrogen. Right? One third of your body, half of your body has come from the atmosphere. That process of converting nitrogen to ammonia consumes 2% of the world's energy and about 3 or so percent of its emissions. It doesn't have to. Science that we need is missing. We make energy at about, if you're really lucky, 50% efficiency. And that's for brand new plants. We don't need to we could make it at 80% efficiency. The problem is the science is missing. So I'd submit that if we could use natural gas, which yes, is a fossil fuel, whoops, um, that, uh, yeah, I tend to wonder, um, that if we can generate half the emissions or, or that and still keep our lifestyle, that would be a step in, into the future. I think I'm uh, trying to just stay in one place. I um, feel like a performer. Okay, so these are the molecules. I'll pick two of them, um, actually one of them. Uh, no, this one and CO2, right? We've all had a lot of problems about CO2. So before I get into how we're going to solve these problems, um, we'll have a chemistry lesson, um, I'll tell you about the benefits. And my vision is we need to get to renewable energy and clean energy, but we're not going to do that right away. Right? It's going to take a while. The infrastructure for getting electrical cars going is going to take a while. We don't want to wait to cut CO2 emissions. We don't want to wait uh, uh, to re get rid of our dependence on oil. oil. Oil is actually messy. We want to get away from coal. What do we do in that transitional period? So what I believe is we should build what I call a natural gas economy that we move away from oil entirely and we build everything, gasoline, chemicals, everything, electricity from natural gas. That's starting to happen, electrical part. We still don't make our chemicals from natural gas. We don't make our fuels from natural gas, our liquid fuels. Why is that, right? As you might know, there's lots of shale gas coming along in this country. We could step off of oil immediately, but the science is missing. The science to convert natural gas to liquids was developed in the 40s. But it's so expensive that if you try to make a fuel from natural gas, a liquid fuel, it'll be two to three times the cost of the fuel from, from gasoline. It doesn't need to be. Since the 40s, we've stopped trying to develop that science base because it's so difficult. We're stuck with this short-term attitude that everything's got to be done in the next two to three years. And what we're not doing is, and we take 90% of our research dollars and we put it into that, and a tiny bit into this disruptive science. The thing is, this developmental science will never get you where you want to be. The disruptive science is going to take a long time, but ultimately it can get there. And I have to tell you, if we're not doing it, the, the Chinese and the rest of the world is doing it, right? I was just invited to China, and, and they're hiring 1,000 Western scientists. And I asked the director, I said, what's the plan? And he said, in 50 years, we plan on being a technological leader. Now, 
they've got a 50-year plan. I don't even think we've got a two-year plan. Um, and, and I laughed, and I said, 50, and he says, no, 50. And I said, that's a long time. He says, have you noticed how long we've been around? <laughs> um, I mean, look, these, you know, they took a major disadvantage, which is their people and became this technological. It's all about technology. The people that own the, we, we will never compete in manufacturing. But if we have the technology that we sell to the rest of the world, that's where our, we'll, we'll succeed. So if you can do this, right, work on this molecule, solve those holy grail problems, everything can be made from that. We can make fuels much cheaper than we can put petroleum. We can make electricity with 50% less, less emissions. If you give me the science that I want for that molecule, one molecule changes the world. Right? We can make all our synthetic materials. The problem is, and I'll come back to this, it's about how fast these molecules can be made to react. And the problem is, the reason this molecule exists in the ground is that it's, it, it resists reaction. And because it re resists reaction, everything we do about it is five, 800 to 1,000 degrees. And because of that high temperature, huge capital cost expense. You, you can't introduce environmentally sound science unless it's what I call doubly green, economically green and environmentally green. And, and the science has got to de develop, de deliver both. So you back integrate and you ask, what's that new science that needs to be in place that will deliver it? And yes, it doesn't happen tomorrow. So what we're going to do is develop the chemistry that will allow that molecule to react very rapidly. And just some numbers here, you're looking at vast potential. In fact, we're trying to spin out a company now that will make this chemical called propylene glycol, which is used in plastics. If we can put that in place and capture most of the market, one billion per year in savings. Right? Non-trivial. Now, um, how does this all connect to what I see as a future, which is called the electric future? And actually, uh, I, I've been talking to FPNL. They're actually funding some of our work at a very modest level. But I believe that in the future, we are going to be driving everything from, from electricity, uh, from PVs, from wind, from, from I think nuclear will play a part. And what I'm here to tell you is that we can actually use that electricity to convert CO2 into fuels if we wanted to. If we had the science to deal with CO2, you won't use a leaf to do this. You'll use electricity to do it. It sounds strange. But I can build you an industrial leaf that's more efficient than a leaf. I mean, what does a leaf do? Right? It takes CO2 and water and sunlight and generate fuels and oxygen. Right? Well, what is this doing? It's taking sunlight and making electricity. Right? That one single panel today is 10 times more efficient than a leaf in terms of collecting the light. And, and if you give me the chemistry here, which we can do already, just not efficiently enough, I can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere more efficiently than a leaf can. It costs me some energy. But remember, I have clean energy coming in. I can make you your fuel. What am I doing with that fuel? I'm storing electrons generated, energy generated here into that fuel. This is a stopgap. What is a fuel? A fuel is just, it turns out, when you combine things and burn things, what's happening is electrons are moving. So it's really high energy electrons that, that you want. And you can store those high energy electrons in fuel, or better yet, you store them in batteries. What's missing in the battery technology, and you've been hearing a bit about it, is new generations of batteries which ultimately comes down to one problem called rate, the rate of the chemical reaction. You give me the chemistry I want, and I will give you a car, electrical car, that drives up, plugs in to the gas station, which implementing a, a power implement there is not going to be difficult. They're already there. And I allow you to power up in five minutes. I do that, and you become all electrical. No battery exists that can do that today, but it's just a rate problem. So this is what I'm talking about. This is a example, it's not the example we're after. 
But it turns out this simple problem of taking CO2 and water, electrons coming from PV or wind or nuclear. You see, electrons doesn't care where they come from. I can take those electrons and I can convert that into making methanol. That methanol can become fuel, it can become plastics, it can become the oil of the future. And then when I want those electrons, I go back this way and I use those electrons to drive my car or whatever else I want to do. This cannot be done today, not rapidly, not cleanly. Put the science in place and we change the world. This in that direction is a leaf. You do it in a big industrial plant, just like we make ammonia. All right, the problem is rate. So how do we, the batteries that we're looking at, we want batteries that are more energy dense than gasoline. So what's the new science? Don't restrict ourselves to what's there. Okay, so we're actually getting some support from FPNL on, on trying to build these batteries. Uh, we need a massive effort. If we can put, just like the Chinese and, and the Saudis are putting cities in place, Russia is building a city to look for this next generation science. The, the Chinese are bringing a thousand Western scientists. I can barely keep two people in my lab. And I was there seven days a week, and some people were in front of their hoods, the research station, seven days. It, if you go there, you, it, it will scare you. The solution is this, right? The problem with all of these molecules is strong bonds. The forces holding these atoms together is very, very strong. And we have not developed the science to break them under mild conditions. We can't do it today. It, it should be doable. I should be able to take this molecule, methane, you actually should burn up right now. Right now, you're in the presence of oxygen. You, you, if, I, if I were to light you up, you would burn all the way to CO2 and water and some minerals spontaneously. The reason you're not is that there's a chemical barrier for that to happen. It's a rate problem. Right? It, it should happen, just like a weight should fall, but there's something that's holding it from falling, and that's the chemical inertness. So how do you fix rates? You fix rates with just like you can deal with medicine and disease and you find molecules that will inhibit enzymes, you find molecules that will fix those rates. Those molecules happen to be called catalysts. What you're seeing here is that all of those problems, every one of those problems is a rate problem and the way you deal with rates is to build catalysts. Nature knew that. You are burning sugar right now in your body at 37 degrees centigrade. If I gave you a lump of sugar and I said, light it up and give me the energy out of it, you couldn't. Nature does it because it has catalysts <laughs> called enzymes. The generations of catalysts we have today will never do what I'm telling you that we've got to do. We've got to build brand new molecules. They're like drugs, very complex, very knowledge intensive, <coughs> very expensive to develop. But we develop them and you change the planet. Right? So these are the molecules and this is the type of thing we're tackling. And we're not going to solve it with just me and two or three people in the lab. But we're one of the most attractive places possibly on the planet, certainly in, 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 in the US. And if we can do it in the Silicon Valley, why not do it here? Why not bring the best of the world to work on the energy problems here? And it does spin out companies. It does spin out money. Right? Why can't we do that? Thank you.
Um, where do you think we're going to end up in 15 years if we continue rejecting massive human money from the government in the U.S. in one way to go? And other countries are doing What's going on? Well, I don't think we should infuse money into companies, but I'll answer your first question because I've thought a lot about this and talked to a lot of my friends. And, and one colleague put it very bluntly and, and, and made me think about it. He says, well, look at England. Look at what they've become. It's not such a bad thing, is it? <laughs> His point was, in the next 10 to 20, 50 years, we will probably become the next England certainly not the superpower that we are today. And why did they do that? They lost the edge. Um, how do we maintain the edge? It, it, it's only through technology. The, the country that owns the cutting edge technology will maintain the military edge, the economic edge, everything else. Um, what's the solution? The solution is what I call, let's stop what I, 401k research, right? Companies, Governments should not be funding companies. Companies cannot do this. They should not do this. This is not within their time, time frame. They should help to support that, right? But countries need to be putting this in place. And the problem, we have tremendous amounts of money being spent on research, but Roy gets a big $300,000 check from the government, and the government says to Roy, go revolutionize the world. And it takes a billion dollars, and it gives everybody 300,000. It's like a 401k plan, right? What do you want in a 401k? When you, want, you distribute according to a lot of stocks, and, and you expect small growth, right? I'm not suggesting they give me a billion dollars, but what we've got to do is to focus those monies. And, and we've got to take risk, and we've got to think, you know, not tomorrow, but like China, what are we going to be in the next 50 years? And when you do that, you are going to come back and say, go fix those molecules. And we can do them. If I can, we are spinning a company off. We've done stuff that nobody else in the world has. If we can do that, a tiny little group, simply because we've dedicated ourselves the last 10, 15 years, we can as a country. So I think a big part of it is, is being willing to take risks, to look into the long term, and to focus and not do the political thing and just distribute the, the money. Let's do a little bit of hydrogen economy. Let's do a little bit of that. A little bit. No, it, it takes leadership. It takes some guts. And um, we've got the brain power. The question is, do we have the will? I, you know, I'm actually probably more patriotic than many of you. I came to this country with 300 bucks in my pocket. Um, and I am where I am. It's a great place, a great culture. I don't think I'd like to see us go the way of England. So. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks.